Good afternoon. I hope you enjoyed the lunch and, and found some time to build the network and the community of practice uh, that we're so keen on here. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all back. Uh, the program is as follows. We'll hear for about five minutes from Dr. Janet Smart, who's one of the faculty members here at the Business School, about some of the research she's conducting on major program management, and she'd like to give you an invitation to participate in this research. Then I'll introduce Dr. Paul Chapman, who's the Academy Director of the Major Projects Leadership Academy to then introduce our speakers for the afternoon. So Dr. Janice Smart, welcome. Thank you, Atif. It's lovely to see so many of you here today and congratulations to Atif and his team for putting something together so quickly and so effectively. Just goes to show you what you can achieve when you put politicians and project managers together. Um, so what I want, so Atif has kindly given me a few minutes to invite you to attend and um, participate in a very small research project that we're doing. There's a, a survey that you can um, uh, find at this QR code. It should take you only about 10 minutes to complete. Um, we're looking at, we're going to ask you to think about uh, projects, large scale projects that you've been involved in, one that's been a success, and if you really try hard, think about one that's maybe not gone so well. And so we'd like you to try and think about um, what were the contributing factors to those, those relative success and failures. Um, if you can't get the QR code um, into your phone right now, I've printed some copies out. They're at the welcome table um, in the reception area with a few of the... Um, you know, copies of the slides as well. So you can either pick up one of these or just scan it in with your phone and it'll take you straight to the survey. Um, we're grateful to Ben Pinches, who many of you will know. He was in the first cohort of the MMPM and uh, some of the work that he has done since then is being, uh, we're exploiting that to deliver this online survey easily and quickly on your phone. It's got all the usual CUREC um, permission. You know all about that. So um, I look forward to your, your results. As many of you as possible, please participate. And of course, we'll be publishing the results and letting you know. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, just to echo Janet's words, I mean, well done, Atif. This is a superb gathering. Well done, all of you, for making time. Um, I'll take the opportunity to, uh, to welcome and introduce Dame Margaret Hodge. Uh, Janet was touching on a little bit of some of the rigour that's associated with, with research, so I, I will demonstrate my own level of rigour, uh, having only just bought a copy of Dame Margaret's book outside, available for the wonderful price of £9.99. I am sure it's an absolute triumph. So it, we'll, we'll start there. The reason I'm absolutely convinced, and I'm actually looking forward, worryingly, I'm looking forward to reading this, um, is Dame Margaret has not only been returned by the good people of Barking six times with, uh, with a huge uh, majority, which I think is something a testimony to something to uh, constituency work that you do. Uh, Dame Margaret has made something of a reputation for herself, but also for the Public Accounts Committee, and I think it's more in that context that we welcome you here today. The rigour that the PAC brings, together with colleagues in the National Audit Office, ensures that hard-working taxpayers, to, to use that wonderful expression, uh, are not ripped off, because that was a concern over many years. I think the other thing that the PAC does wonderfully is it holds the individuals to account, and that's incredibly relevant for MSc in major program management students and also the participants who've been on MPLA, because it is about individuals. So rather than being able to slip off into the shadows when things go wrong, it is that ability to hold people to account. Now, much of what we see on television is where people are being lambasted. Uh, there are also many examples, and it's something about the media letting us down, where the PAC and Dame Margaret actually celebrate and congratulate those who embrace that accountability and do what we expect of them. Benefits delivery is difficult, it often needs a special kind of person to do it. And Dame Margaret, I've seen you do that, is congratulate and applaud those who do succeed. So 
Thank you for coming today. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, thanks very much indeed. I'm delighted to be here because actually the Major Projects Academy and the uh, uh, teaching that takes place here is something that the Public Accounts Committee warmly welcomed uh, because we thought the training that is offered is absolutely critical to improve value for money in public expenditure. Uh, so I am really delighted to be joining you here. My observations are going to be focused on the topic of the day, which is making good on our promises. At least that's what I was told the conference was about. Um, and it comes really from those five years as chairing the Public Accounts Committee, but it also comes from a lifetime of public service. I think I've touched every bit of the public sector that you could possibly uh, uh, work in. And many of my reflections are in the, in, in the book that I've also recently published. Now, I just want to tell you a bit about the Public Accounts Committee because people don't know about it. It is the oldest of the select committees in the House of Commons, founded in 1861 by Gladstone, um, who thought it was going to be a really dull committee. And when I told my researcher that I was going to be chair of it for five years, she threatened to resign if it, wasn't, if it didn't prove interesting at all. But of course, Peter Hennessy said it is the queen of the select committees. And I think we found that in the work that we did. In 1861, when Gladstone first established the committee, uh, they, they completed one report um, per annum. In the five years that I chaired it, uh, we completed 246 reports, all unanimous. And the committee is always chaired by a member of the opposition, but reflects Parliament. So it had a majority of people in, those, in, that, in that period from the coalition government serving on it. So getting unanimity from the extreme left to the extreme right, where we might disagree at everything from gay marriage to Europe to immigration, was, I think, a testimony, actually, to the uh, work that we all put in as a team. And I think we were unanimous because wherever you are on the political spectrum, value for money, making good on your promises, really matters. So if you're on the right of the political spectrum, you may want to cut the size of the state, cut taxation, and therefore eking best value out of every pound you spend is imperative. And if, like me, you're on the left, where I believe in the importance of public investment in things like education or housing, to actually transform and equalize people's life chances. If I'm going to take your hard-earned money in taxation, I have got to give you the confidence that actually that money will be well spent. So that uh, commitment to value for money is equally important. And one of my constant moans is that no select, uh, no po too few politicians really recognise the importance of the agenda that we pursued in the Public Accounts Committee. We didn't, have, we didn't have much power. Our power was to invite, maybe some of you in the audience, to come and give evidence to us. And if you turn down our very kind invitation, I was then given a piece of A4 which ordered you to come and give evidence in front of the Select Committee. And I was always nervous signing this. I had to do this about eight times. And I said to my clerk, so what happens if they still refuse to come? And the answer came that I could then take them in front of the House of Commons and they would be uh, uh, placed, imprisoned, in the clock tower under Big Ben to reflect on uh, their iniquities. <laughs> the other thing that I've got to tell you about is when I first got the job, you get a room. And I was a bit reluctant to move to this room because I had a room next door to all my political mates. But as I walked in, it's a lovely room on the first floor of the uh, uh, upper committee corridor in the House of Commons overlooking the Thames. And down one wall are pictures of all my predecessors. And I discovered to my horror that there had been more murders of chairs of the Public Accounts Committee. <laughs> than any other committee. I discovered that three had been in jail and they were all Labour MPs, although I then discovered actually one was a con conscientious objector, another a pacifist, and another had supported the su suffragettes. I discovered there was one who'd gone bankrupt, some of you might remember, Edward Ducan, and yet had chaired the committee. And then I discovered that Harold Wilson had also been chair of the Public Accounts Committee. And I couldn't quite work out, on his way up in politics, not on his way down, on his way up, he'd chosen. 
And then I uncovered that in his day, uh, backbench opposition MPs didn't have offices. They used to have those old fashioned Victorian desks where, where you had the desk attached to the seat in the corridors all around the Palace of Westminster. The only person to get an office was the chair of the Public Accounts Committee. So he simply took the job to get the, to get the office. <laughs> We followed the taxpayer's pound, that was my mantra. We went wherever the taxpayer's pound went. And in 1861, this is quite astonishing, um, government expenditure was 69 million pounds. That's about eight billion pounds in today's money. The budget this year is 770 billion pounds. So the enormity of the task has just been exponential. The other thing that's happened which makes it more difficult is there is real fragmentation of the public sector. If you think back when we used to have these sort of old big departments with big services, we now have independent hospital trusts, chains of academy schools, and the whole thing is much more fragmented when you're trying to follow the taxpayer's pound. And the other element is this, it, it, it surprises people, but over half of the services that are provided from your money, from the taxpayer's money, and this is taking out money that is transferred in terms of pension or benefits, so it's just the services side of it. Over half are now provided by the private sector, and that, of course, is growing with the commitment of the, this government to uh, more privatisation. And again, following the taxpayer's pound into those contracts became very, very difficult. Um, I felt terribly privileged because there was a huge variety. I mean, one, we'd meet twice a week. One week we might be looking at the prison estate, one on a Monday. On a Wednesday we'd be looking at how the government dealt with the Ebola crisis. One Monday we might be looking at tax avoidance or universal credit. On a Wednesday we might look at, be looking at residential homes for people with learning disabilities. It was a massive agenda and a huge privilege and I learned a lot. And as John said, we didn't do all bad reports. In fact, you're going to hear from one of our good reports following me, Crossrail, which we thought was a, a very good project. But it is impossible to get these reports publicised. It's impossible to publicity. And I'm always reminded of the one occasion when we did a report on 16 to 18 year olds in education. And it was quite a good report. And I get a phone call from the Today programme saying, will you come on tomorrow and talk about your report? And I said, fine. And the researcher says to me, what are you going to say? So I said, well, it's quite a good uh, uh, verdict on, on, on the work that's being done, room for improvement, but things are moving in the right, right direction. So she said, I thought you were going to be critical. So I said, no, 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 it's a complimentary report. She said, I better go away and read it. Uh, <laughs> And then she went away and read it, and of course came back and dropped me as an item on the, on, on the Today programme. But let me just now, in terms of what you're here to talk about, reflect on really, when I wrote this book, it gave me that chance to sort of think back on what had I learned in that five years. And I think the first rather depressing conclusion I came to is there is unconscionable waste in the, in, in, in the way that we use taxpayers' money, particularly in the area of big projects. Twas ever thus, you look at Harold Wilson in 1960 talking about the Blue Street Missile Programme, and he, says, he said there in the House, I think that the House must agree that the system of control and the estimating in this case have been utterly deplorable. That was 1960. I could have said a very, very similar um, uh, statement to that in 2015. He then goes on to say, this is quite amusing about the Blue uh, Street Programme, the estimated cost of halting the programme was over 100 million pounds. This is 1960. What has the minister to say? The minister says that the cost of completing it would be between 500 and 500 and 600 million pounds. In other words, he says that we haven't wasted 100 million pounds, we've saved between 400 and 500 pounds. You lucky people. <laughs> and I sometimes felt the same on that. Um, it's very difficult to pick out examples of what, where we came across the unconscionable waste, but let me talk about uh, the MOD, which is probably, we looked at all the major projects regularly every year in the MOD, and I know efforts have been made to improve, and I know that there have been marginal improvements, but I don't think I would find a very different picture today to the one I found five or six years ago. One, of the, one afternoon, 
We were literally looking for two hours at the major projects, and we identified eight billion pounds of what I can only describe as torn up pound notes, where people had uh, canceled projects, delayed, uh, changed specifications, all things like that, which had literally just led to eight billion pounds of waste. And the aircraft carriers for me was one of the worst stories, where um, actually Gordon Brown had been anxious to uh, commission new, two, new, two new aircraft carriers, more for industrial reasons, because he wanted to keep the jobs than for defense reasons. He originally, it was going to cost 2.8 billion pounds. I think probably in the end, we're going to spend 7 billion pounds thereabouts. The contract was signed in 2008 for uh, 3.65 billion pounds. And they signed it knowing there was no money in the budget, knowing, and that's where coming to officials as well, I'm critical of officials in that decision. Without money in the budget, six months in, they had to pause the contract, but of course they had to call, keep all the people in place. They paused it for 18 months, and that 18 months cost us 1.8 billion pounds. It's a huge amount of money. The coalition government come in, they then sort of say they're gonna review whether we need it, BAE, I don't know if there's anybody from BAE here today, but BAE writes them a frightening letter saying it'll cost you more to cancel than it will do to continue. Nobody, I think, ever challenged BAE uh, properly around that. What they did decide to do, because every politician changes their mind, was to change the specification and have a new uh, aeroplane land on there, which meant they had to put on cats and traps to, um, to, change, to change what the, what the carriers themselves did. They didn't really know what it would cost. They hadn't a clue about the technology, but they did change their mind. They said it will cost, I think at the time, uh, they said it would cost about 500 to 800 million. They come back to Parliament 16 months later, having discovered, surprise, surprise, that it'll probably cost over two billion pounds to do the state change specification. So they revert to the original specific specification. And again, all of that costs 74 million pounds, further wasted. And it isn't just big things in the MOD. We came across a contract for six million pounds for earplugs, for people on the front line, which I don't think they'd ever been properly tested. And the moment the people on the front line put them on, they didn't work, so it had to be binned. We came across the estate of the MOD. The MOD owns one and a half percent of the land here in the UK. They haven't a clue what, is, what they should hang on to, whether it's properly used, whether there's potential to make more money out of it. Um, they were getting rid of more people than they were land, and you'd have thought there might have been a, some relationship of it. And of course, there were very important 15 golf courses on this very, very valuable land. Um, this, we could, IT, there's probably a lot of you who are here on IT. I don't know which was the worst of the IT, but... Um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, this is a bit gloomy. NHS IT, think about that one, where originally uh, Tony Blair had had a meeting with Bill Gates and decided that actually it was going to be a brilliant idea to completely uh, 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 introduce uh, one system into the whole of this very complex organisation. Um, or not understanding the, the changes that would have to, have to occur in the way people worked and how they, uh, how they managed their services. Originally, it was going to be two, two, just over 2 billion, 2.3 billion. By the time we first looked at it, that figure, estimated figure, was 11.4 billion. Uh, no, very little had been delivered, and the coalition government decided after we'd spent 6.4 billion, actually spent it, to abandon the program. And a year later, Jeremy Hunt comes back and says he's going to digitise the whole of the NHS IT yet again. So embark on the very same journey that he'd abandoned. And universal credit, I'd love to go back and see what is really happening to universal credit. Maybe there's somebody here who works on it. But again, uh, it was supposed to be about two and a half billion pounds. By the time we had our final hearing just before the general election, we'd spent 700 billion pounds, million pounds, a lot of which will be written off, and fewer than 18,000 claimants. That's 0.3% of all claimants were actually uh, used, uh, enjoying universal credit, and they tended to be the very simple benefit claimants. So those are sort of some of the big projects that stick in my mind. But it's not just the public sector. I have to say that 
I'm not ideological about this. I don't mind whether it's delivered by the public or the private sector, as long as it's delivered in the interests of the public and the public interest is maintained. But we came across too many examples of private sector failings, which were not that different from public sector failings. PFI, where I think excessive profits were made by the private sector. We looked at the welfare to work program, where one of the companies, A4E, which li lived only on public sector contracts, the woman who ran it gave herself an 8.6 million pound dividend in one year alone. That was the money she'd earned out of public sector um, uh, welfare contracts. There was the f infamous tagging contract at MOJ, where over a period of eight or 10 years, the two contractors had been claiming for people who'd let, who uh, of tag, claiming they were tagging prisoners, who actually the prisoners had actually, their sentences had been completed, so they didn't need to be tagged. They'd gone back to prison, so they didn't need to be tagged. And in some cases they had died and there were still claims going in uh, under the tagging contract. And I think the, the most amusing for you, and perhaps not the biggest, was we looked at an MOJ, Ministry of Justice interpretation contract, where they said they, were going, they needed to cut the amount of money they were spending on interpreters. And instead of managing that in-house, the only way they could manage the cut was by privatizing, always the worst reason for outsourcing uh, a, a particular service. Uh, and they got this contractor, they did the financial due diligence so they could tick the financial due diligence box. What that told them was that the contractor couldn't deal with a contract of more than a million pounds. So they gave the contractor a 40 million pound contract. On day one, there were simply not enough interpreters working. It was Mars, it was about 200 and something instead of 1,500 interpreters in the courts. So justice was denied, P P uh, justice was delayed, people were spending more time in prison than they should have, 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 have had to do. Nobody knew the cost of that. And they went, then went into a frantic attempt to recruit more interpreters. And I think the greatest story we came across, I still don't know whether it's true or not, is one irritated interpreter who put his cat in as a potential interpreter, as an expert in feline language. <laughs> and that cat was then offered a job. <laughs> um, so how can we, what are the things that I think that I drew out of this? I'll, I'll try and bring this together. What did I draw out of all this, uh, uh, these issues that I made? And I'm really rushing it off the top. Um, I'm not going to talk about the general issues that I'm sure you're, you're going to be focusing on, things like the proper data, the proper planning, the proper timescales, all hugely important in managing, uh, uh, managing this. I'm going to talk a little bit more widely. The skills within government remain inappropriate on the whole for the tasks that they have to undertake. The civil service traditionally was a policy making machine. They threw out, when I left university, people went into the civil service because they were policy wonks, not because they were deliverers of service. That has changed. The nature of government, especially because so many services are now delivered by the private sector, has changed. And the civil service now ought to be a machine, much more of a machine for delivering services. Of course, we need some policy intelligence, but the focus is all wrong. Uh, and that means we've not only that you have to train people in a different way, hence the importance of the academy here, but you've also got to, within the civil service, value those skills. And they're still not valued in the same way that uh, policy skills are. So, and you, you see it, for example, and you've got to value the jobs that go with the skills. So, you know, there isn't great value uh, in having a job that lets a contract, that decides, uh, that actually co commissions a contract. There's almost no value in having a job that monitors that contract. So there's got to be a complete culture change in the way that the civil service sees itself and what it values. I think there's got to be a change in career progression. The way in which you progress in the civil service is by changing jobs every two years. One of the reasons, for example, of the prison estate, actually the renewal of the prison estate was one of the good things we looked at, was the guy who had been in charge had been there you know, for 10, 15 years. He knew what he was doing. And even the most recent NAO report, although the government says it's uh, accepted this, even the most recent NAO report 
um, just uh, you know a couple of months back, showed that out of the out of 73 programs that were four years or more old, so they'd been going for that uh, length of time, only four had the same senior responsible officer. So today we are still not uh, providing a career progression which allows people to stay uh, in the job. When I was children's minister in the Blair Brown years, and I had that job, Blair used to shift you, they shifted you far too often even as ministers, but I was in that job for about two and a half years. At the end of that period, I had better institutional memory than any of the officials who worked for me. That's a scary thing to say. Uh, and uh, uh, it, one of the worst examples we came across was when they tried to rationalize the 999 service, bring it from each fire service down to uh, a, a, reg a regional thing. They had five different senior responsible officers in six years. They had four different project directors over that period. And after, uh, those six years, they abandoned the project at a cost to all of us, about half a billion pounds was literally wasted. So that's a change in the career progression. The next thing is leadership. There was one really interesting session we had when we were looking at uh, project management, and we had two perm sex sitting before us. Neither had ever run a project, and I think a must-have for anybody who takes that leadership role uh, uh, in, in government, they must have had that experience of managing projects in the modern civil service. And for me, I say it in, uh, in the book, and uh, permanent secret is hatred, but what at the top is just all wrong, it's a sort of Masonic lodge. Everybody bar one has been to Oxford and Cambridge. Anybody who comes in from the outside, uh, I give Manzoni perhaps another year or so. Uh, everybody who comes in from the outside is very quickly rejected by the culture. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, you've, if, if I were being radical, and I think this is something we could do across party, I don't think it's a partisan issue, I would really completely transform that cadre of permanent secretaries. Not take more from the private sector, but get some from local government, health and elsewhere, so that you just break up that culture. And there is no accountability. Um, the head of DWP, who oversaw uh, um, a disaster on uh, endless programmes, he looked at the work programme, universal credit, the disability, uh, all the disability programmes, was uh, rewarded with a knighthood. The woman who was in charge of HMRC and where they couldn't even get to answer the phone properly after all the time that we'd uh, tried to pursue it, was, in, was, uh, was rewarded with a damehood. And compare that, when I was doing the history, this research for my book, with a Colonel Buchan, who in 1920 was called before the Public Accounts Committee. He had been charged with dismantling the information capability in the MOD at that time. We'd won the war and we didn't need any information capability. And he spent 101 pounds, six shillings and threepence, uh, old money, on uh, 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 paying for somebody to come to London to do his job and double paying two people. And he was hauled before the Public Accounts Committee, uh, admonished and made to pay the money back. That would, of course, never happen today. And that takes me to an important issue, because I don't really want to go back to that. But there is no proper link between responsibility and accountability. This is an area where I want to do some work coming, uh, over the coming time. We have what is called uh, the... Uh, the code, I think it's called the code of, of, of ministerial accountability, which means for anything that happens, any money that is spent, civil servants are accountable to ministers who in the, are accountable to parliament. So no civil servant, bar the accounting officer who is vaguely accountable to us, uh, no civil servant is really openly accountable for what they do. It goes through this code of ministerial accountability. Now, when that was established in 1918, there were 28 civil servants in the Home Office. Today, despite all the cuts, there are 28,000 civil servants in the Home Office. And having that very closed mechanism of accountability, uh, I think just doesn't work in the modern day. I think we want much more open accountability. And there's a lie that, I, uh, that is at the heart of this uh, mechanism of accountability, because whilst ministers are accountable for what their civil servants do, they can't hire or fire them. 
And I don't think it works for anybody. It doesn't work for the civil servants who can't be honest about what happens and what advice they give. And it doesn't work for ministers who have, often have to take the can for stuff they get wrong. Opening that up and changing that, I think, would be an amazingly important reform. And of course it would give difficulties. It means that we might see what civil servants say to ministers about particular policies. But I think that's a good thing. I think the more openness we can have about policy making, probably the more sustainable and better the policies we have um, uh, will be. Final few things. I think we need a much stronger centre in government. Those of you that will work in the private sector would be amazed at how weak that centre is. We've got three departments at the centre. We've got the Treasury, the Cabinet Office and Number 10. They spend their time arguing with each other and they don't provide any sensible sense, uh, uh, se central direction that you would see in a complex private uh, organisation. That doesn't mean you want to centralise decision making. There's no, you can have both strong centre and good decentralisation. But there is no sharing, for example, of the experience of what went wrong with PFI when they start letting contracts on uh, uh, energy contracts, which were one of the awful contracts that we looked at, allows you to share experience. People work in silos. There's no sort of working together across government. So you see this absurdity where we're trying to get people out of hospitals, but we're trying to keep that NHS budget going. But what do we do? We cut local authority spending where 40% of their expenditure goes on social care. So of course you get bed blocking uh, in the hospitals. People don't think about tomorrow. So PFI is classic there. We've got something like 39 billion pounds worth of PFI assets. They're gonna cost us 150 billion pounds to pay for them of which about a third goes on interest charges. And we've invested, and I take uh, my share of blame for this, we've invested, for example, in very big hospitals. And what do we now want to do? We actually want to get people out of those big hospitals and care for them in the community. So we have an inappropriate asset. And that, paying for that, is the first call on any NHS budget before paying for doctors uh, and nurses. We don't exploit our bulk purchasing in anything. The thing that drove me completely mad was having the home office in front of us. If we just had the same shirts throughout the police force, we could save 30% of the money we spend on police, but they can't agree on where the pockets should go. Um, and it goes on in that way. Um, the, I just want to say something about the private sector, because the private sector is going to deliver public service with our money. I think there have to be some changes there too. I think. The government needs to have better client skills, obviously, and that's what today is in part about. I think those contracts have to be open to public account. Hiding behind commercial confidentiality won't do. And if you don't want to enter that market, you shouldn't. But if you're in it, you should actually be accountable to the uh, National Audit Office. You might actually be open for freedom of information, and you should certainly have open accounting. Um, I, it, we haven't, we've privatised, but we haven't created markets. We've created oligopolies all over the place. We've killed off a lot of very good uh, smaller private sector providers. And we've just been, we ought to create proper markets with proper competition if we really do believe that competition will be get you better quality and lower price. And we should demand ethical standards from our private sector partners so that they don't cheat in the way they did uh, uh, on the tagging contract, and they pay their taxes uh, in a proper and fair way so that the money is there to provide the very services and to provide the contracts from which they benefit. And my very final point is that there is too much sort of revolving door in, 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 in the way these things work. Um, our worst example, I mean, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a project management example, actually, was we looked at a, the widening of the M25, where the conclusion from the National Audit Office was that a billion pounds had been wasted by the way that contract had been uh, designed and let, it was just let into uh, uh, during the financial crisis, so in, uh, interest rates went out, but a billion pounds had been wasted. We wanted to interview the guy who'd been in charge of it, but were told, were told we couldn't do so 
because he'd gone to work for the consultancy that had, that had earned five million pounds from the contract and actually was resident in Spain. That's just not good enough. And on tax, it was much worse. You had people from the consultancy firms going into government, uh, giving us the technical answers to a policy idea that government might have. So writing those technical rules and then coming straight out and exploiting them for, ra for tax avoidance purposes, often schemes which have no other purpose but, then, but to avoid tax. Those are some of my thoughts. Making good on our promises matter. And I know that there are hundreds of thousands of really dedicated, good public servants who do an excellent job each day. And actually, the ones on the front line often get let down by the ones that we came in contact with when we were doing our work in the Public Accounts Committee. I do believe we can and should do better. I don't want us to become complacent. I, don't want, I want to see an end of this optimism bias. I don't want us only to hear the good news stories, although I want to promote success. And I'm convinced that Martin Luther King had it right when he said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dame Hodge. Um, Dame Hodge is a veteran of grilling people, but this time she's allowed us for 10 minutes to turn the tables on her. Um, so we're going to take questions and answers for about 10 minutes, um, lady up front. If we wait for the microphone, please. Tell me who you are. Will you tell me who you are? Tell me who you are. That's right. Because I can't read it. Sorry. I'm not. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Olga, Olga Hart from Paco Hennepin. Uh, you talked a lot about the wastage in the programs, and I was wondering uh, how uh, those reports are being incorporated in a future program, similar programs uh, that are being run by the government. Are there any recommendations, uh, any lessons learned that are being taken to, into the account for future programs? Thank you. Shall I take one at a time? How do you want me to do it? Yes. OK, um, a little bit, but not enough. So we, I tried really hard to make sure that the recommendations we had were, didn't just become uh, you know, reports on shelves, but really uh, were en enacted. And the way we did that was to bring people back. So once they, our recommendations go out there, they have to decide whether to accept them. If they don't implement them, they come back. But I think this is the, it is a weakness in government. People change jobs, so they haven't got that institutional memory. Um, and there is this very weak centre, so that there is no way really of sharing what's good and not. Now, you know, the fact we're here today is a force for good. The fact that actually there's this partnership between uh, the business school and government to try and uh, uh, improve the training is a really, really important force for good. But I bet too many of the people on this course won't stay in the job that they're in at the moment for long enough to really benefit from what they learn here. So it's a little bit not enough. Um, do you think that people exploit the government because it's a sitting target? I mean, governments can't escape, governments can't lie, governments can't not honour a contract. And listening to your, your litany, I, I just felt that, you know, that was coming across. And in your work, you may have felt that as well. Um, I like to think this is where we made a little bit of a difference. So if I look at private sector companies um, uh, provide, uh, who, with contracts for, with government, the, before, we, before my term of office, before that time, no private sector company would come to give evidence to the uh, Public Accounts Committee because the structure is that the only person who is, is uh, uh, responsible is the accounting officer. And all too often you had... Um, uh, commercial confidentiality used as a reason for not understanding. It drove me, it drives, it drives me mad on tax, but it drove me mad on the work programme, the five billion pound work programme that the government, for example, uh, undertook. Um, and I think 
the government is a very poor, I mean, you're going to hear from a really good client in, it, in, in Crossrail, but, you know, the sad thing is that those examples are too, far, too few and far between. The government on the whole is a poor, poor client, and of course that gets exploited. And there's a sort of culture around, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, I sort of, I, I've got a chapter in the book that I call Other People's Money. So you don't, I've, I've worked, I worked in Pricewaterhouse, Coopers as, an, as a consultant, as an con accountant for a few years. And my, the sort of culture there was much more focused that, you know, we were conscious of the bottom line. It was, it was our money. The moment it's, you use taxpayers' money, it becomes other people's money, and the attitude changes. And that's one of the cultural things, very tough to do, that we need to get a hold of. And I think what I would say about the sort of capita G for S's, those circos, for example, who were picking up a lot of the services contracts, they got really good at winning contracts. That's where they built their expertise. They have a long, long, long way to go at being good at running services. Doesn't mean they're all bad. Doesn't mean, you know, there are, you can again point to some really good services being run. But just winning the contract without being able then to run the service and probably knocking out some good SME providers uh, in the course of doing that is, is not a good way forward. So I think, yes, there is some exploitation. Not everybody, not all the time, but too much. And I think it's this thing about other people's money. Name Stephen Way on Manchester X Nuclear X Hydro. Wondering what has changed. Uh, we all got I older and wiser, but no better, I think, trained to influence those who think that their needs are unique, that there's nothing to be learned from others. And perhaps mixed with that, the virility item, which is irrelevant after this morning. But coupled with that, we talk about lessons learnt. They're not. I think it's a phrase that should be a criminal one. I think it should be lessons to be learnt. <laughs> and until you see a visible effect, mm. that's what they are. One question. There was a book on the blunders of government five, seven yeah. years ago, which said it was the fault of the MPs, the backbenchers, for not holding the front benches to task. And it really indicated there's a nice closed circuit through civil servant and so on. Is that really a valid picture? Um, inevitably, in my book, I focus on, uh, uh, on uh, the executive. Interesting enough, we're the only committee that never interviews uh, ministers, and I liked that because it meant you didn't get the waffle that I'm very good at doing, that politicians are good at. You actually got a much more direct engagement with people responsible for the job. I think it's both. I think it's both. I think... The problem is politicians are just like those policy wonks who joined the civil service. Everybody likes the new idea. Can you think of the, a more radical way of privatising or a more radical way of equalising life chances? Everybody focuses on that. They don't think, you know, it's, there's nothing really sort of sexy about looking at how money is currently spent on current programmes for the politicians as well as for the civil servants. And I talk to my colleagues the whole time about that because we were you know the national audit office was really anxious to actually that it's got a wealth of data and its data cannot be challenged i mean there's a sort of objectivity about the uh, findings that they have which give you a basis for your inquiries which is very helpful and they're not you know they're not always right but they are often most and mostly right that should be used by all the select committees and um, there should be much more looking at how Current, um, current expenditure work. And I can tell you just from my uh, email traffic and, 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 and my uh, post bag, the work we did really resonated with, uh, with people, you know, across political persuasion, across the country, across gender, across age, across everything. So if the public want it, I mean, here we are, you know, in a post-Trump, post-Brexit era, era, we've got to start listening to what the public want us to do rather than um, uh, uh, focusing on what we think are the sort of uh, ways that we should spend our time. And politicians ought to spend more time uh, thinking. And the other thing, I mean, I say this, there was one extraordinary time. Uh, 
I think Heseltine started sort of urban inner city initiatives. How are we going to regenerate our inner city initiatives? At one point, I counted up how many initiatives we'd had. 18 over something like 10 years. Nothing ever given time to bed in. Every minister, we change ministers too often, every minister thinks that they'll leave their legacy by creating a new initiative rather than, again, thinking about how actually they can deliver for the public better value for the taxpayers' money. So I think you're right to blame us as much as you are the executive, but I think both have a role to play. Hello, it's, uh, my name's Mike Hockey from Rock. Uh, I've got two kind of related questions. Uh, the first one is, do you think uh, Donald Trump will build his wall to time and budget? <laughs> <laughs> and a related, more serious one is, how do you think uh, a man of uh, questionable ethics and uh, sanity will do running the largest country? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, I am just so depressed by politics at the moment. I'm, uh, 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 I'm a, whether it's... Brexit, Jerry Corbyn, or Donald Trump, it's all very depressing for me. But <laughs> um, um, I'll tell you the problem with the wall. I was thinking about this on the way, because, he, you know, politicians are so, have lost such confidence among the people we're elected to rep, who vote for us, that if he doesn't deliver it, all he'll do is show that he's equally a member of the establishment who does what he wants and doesn't really listen to anybody else. So the political um, uh, force of, of actually him delivering is huge because it was a big, big issue. Yet the absurdity of the policy is there for all of us to see. So I haven't a clue whether he'll build it or not, but I, uh, he's, he's left himself with a dreadful, um, dreadful problem. And um, I mean, the, the, the good... You know, it's quite interesting. America's got this checks and balances, and he's not the favourite in the Republican Party, so one hopes the checks and balances will prevent some of his excesses. But one of the interesting things about che checks and balances, and you, you've got to think about how we operate as a country, it's, it's my own committee. We went to look at the American equivalent of our committee, and uh, we had absolutely no support. We had a sort of little committee... Uh, secretariat of five people and because we were so busy they were basically shuffling the paper making sure that people came to give evidence that was their job um, and I depended I had one very very talented young researcher and I had three people who very generously gave of their time once a week um, who were sort of good experts in public um, sector finance and we would talk about what I'd done in the previous week what I might do in the future and how I could tackle the various hearings but that was it I did get to have a lot of whistleblowers, and I did have a lot of good investigative journalists. I think I'm the only one in the House of Commons who has a good word to say about journalists. Uh, in America, and that's sort of, it, it, it goes to American politics, they had 180 people supporting the committee that was my, the equivalent to my committee, and they divide them, uh, 120, sorry, I think it was 120, so there were 80 to the majority party, 40 to the minority party. And actually, they never did anything because it all became terribly partisan. Whereas we, in a way, although I had really extreme left and extreme right, because we were dependent on each other, we had to work as a team and collaborate. And we actually did were better at getting things done. So that's a difference between American politics and mine. I can't remember your last question. I've now forgotten it. Have I done all right? Okay. <laughs> Jesuit school and one of my priests used to say there's no point doing something efficiently that should not be done at all um, and mm -hmm. I think it, he'd be Mr. Trump might be uh, served by some advice from from this priest. <laughs> <laughs>